Words Unplugged, and we're talking today about the five pillars of Siam. So, Malathy, tell us what your inspiration was for updating this white paper. Sure, Michael. So, uh, I think like sometime back, maybe like a decade back, so uh, customer identity access management is oriented more towards individual consumers. And um, so it basically focused on uh, uh, like how individual consumers log into e-commerce applications, online banking applications, uh, those sort of stuff. So that's why that particularly includes mostly uh, we were talking about authentication mainly. Uh, and then uh, I think we are talking about privacy and compliance and specifically uh, the scalability and availability because we have to cater for um, uh, peak times when it comes to e-commerce likewise. But my main asp uh, aspiration to update this article is the emergence of uh, B2B SaaS apps. And um, that basically targeted these enterprise customers and the need for CIM in that space. Uh, for example, like five to six years back, um, these uh, uh, basically, when it comes to B2B context, there were mostly software installations within the enterprise network. But later, uh, it has been uh, the trend was towards cloud computing and SaaS applications, and there are a lot of SaaS applications that emerged. Uh, so with that, the requirements for uh, uh, B2B CIM actually uh, started to image and that has been uh, a, a main demand uh, from the CIM vendors. So with that, I rather felt that the five pillars needed to focus on the term customer uh, and uh, uh, and basically it could be individual customers or business clients. So it should cater for the both, both of those segments. And uh, so with that, I started uh, thinking about what could be the five key requirements uh, that need to be satisfied by a CM solution to cater for both these segments uh, that would help the business to achieve three main goals, which is uh, like to uh, support for frictionless personalized experience and to ensure security and um, compliance and also to ensure efficient operations. So uh, that was my aspiration to update this article. Awesome. So, you know, you mentioned up at the front of the paper that Siam can really become a strategic asset. Yeah. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of companies that have done a great job here? Yeah, uh, one good example I would say is Spotify. Uh, they have um, they start with social login options as an entry point, and after that, basically when the users uh, started uh, uh, start consuming their service, they basically uh, provides uh, personalization factors. Basically, they can choose their favorite songs and discover personalized play, uh, playlists, and they give podcast sessions likewise. And another good example is, of course, Amazon. Like, um, uh, sure. Yeah. So basically, uh, when you start accessing, you get uh, targeted advertisements and targeted sessions. And when it comes to B2B case, I think Slack is a good example. So they provide uh, uh, facility for that means to uh, support for enterprise login and configure that. And also they give uh, uh, enterprise get great security uh, with customized uh, permissions and security policies. Uh, further, like they also provide some um, customizable capabilities. So uh, I think these are good examples uh, of companies or businesses who have used CIM well. Great example. So uh, let's take a step back and and just for the uninitiated, non technical person, kind of what would be an, a good analogy for what Siam is? It's obviously customer identity and access management, but how would we explain that to you know a loved one that's not in the industry? Yeah, that's true. So, um, so as you said, customer Siam is a kind of a specialist application of identity and access management uh, targeted on customer identities. So uh, we can think of uh, CIM as a, a gatekeeper and a guide uh, within a digital amuse amusement park. And first thing it ensures is that the customers uh, can enter through the gates, right? So um, 
if you take the physical word it would be a ticket mm. uh, but when it comes to digitally so there needs to be some login mechanism some authentication so it could be uh, using some social login options passwordless options um pass keys anything like that uh then uh like once you enter so typically again in the physical world based on the ticket uh, you uh, you have you get assigned to a particular ride right so that basically based on your preference and the ride you choose and you are only authorized to get that ride so similarly in the digital world uh, basically based on your access based on the privileges you have you will be uh, taken over a particular right and you will be authorized uh, only uh, for that right do i have the b ticket or the a ticket right yeah <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> and uh, then basically like um, your right can be customized based on the way that you have been interacted with that service uh, over time it could be like based on on the number of visits you have paid to the amusement park and based on the food that you have uh, bought previously and what sort of rights you have chosen so the more and more you engage uh, with the uh, with the uh, right uh it can give you a very personalized experience so that's mm-hmm. where uh, personalization comes in so i basically see three key points here the first thing is the identification and the second thing is managing uh, access uh based on that uh, identification and then like giving you a personalized experience so those are the th- three main things that i see cm can help it And I can see that scenario playing out as you said the more you use the experience and the more history you have then the more personalized that experience can be and maybe a suggestion could be we know you love roller coasters there's a short line right now yep. uh, to go to your favorite roller coaster right so that's a great a great analogy so you mentioned a couple different types of customers in the the C and Siam you said consumers and you said like other businesses what are some other examples of who the customer can be yeah so as we uh, discussed previously of course consumers are the individual consumers like we interact with um, for example basically we interact with many applications day to day it could be we are taking a uber ride or it could be we are uh, interacting with the online banking application so we we act as individual consumers right so the next case is similarly we might be uh, interacting with various government services it could be to renew our driving license to renew revenue license likewise so in that case uh, we act as citizens so from the government services side so that's another customer type uh then as we discussed previously when it comes to enterprise applications of course there are different enterprises who come and uh, basically uh, buy that uh, uh, enterprise uh, service uh, it could be like you have a subscription for salesforce you have you might have a subscription for slack so it's it's for your particular organization and uh eventually employees of your organization will be the consumers but you your enterprise will be a customer for that digital uh service uh and when it comes to so this can go broader than that basically um uh when it comes to digital services they rather uh, look for uh, growth opportunities or partnerships and resellers in different regions um likewise right so at that point you might even uh, have to interact with these different other third party organizations and their employees will be accessing your services and doing customizations and resell them so that's another segment of customers that the digital business need to address for all right so let's get down to us what are the five pillars of siam yeah so five pillars of sam includes basically the user onboarding and registration uh, then comes user authentication uh, then comes uh, authorization and access management uh, self service uh, and finally uh, the integration uh, with various systems of records uh, and business tools 
And these five pillars are kind of the same five pillars that we talked about in our previous paper, but you're just adding, not just, but adding new color, new examples, and new levels of details within those five pillars. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. And there are some modifications uh, as well, not the exact same. But this is, as I said, this is more focused on the customer we see today and a more generalized approach to address uh, the customers uh, that we cater for today. Okay, so let's take the first one, user onboarding and registration. You you gave the Spotify example where maybe I can use like a, a social account to uh, to log in. Uh, yeah. Break that down for us, kind of what are the different ways people can onboard and register? Yeah, so when it comes to consumer-facing, and I mean individual consumer-facing applications, as you said, social login is a very common uh, mechanism to onboard to the application. And... Uh, but when it comes to and and however like uh, today um, uh, we see passwordless options are getting adopted more. It's mm -hmm. it could be just like you provide your email link, uh, email and you get a link to your email and you just click it and log in. So that's more adopted uh, and people feel more secure about it because you are not again sharing your social, uh, in social identities uh, with the application. And the other case is of course pass keys. So the there are passwordless options getting adopted more and more today. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, but when it comes to applications like online banking uh, and uh, financial applications and possibly government applications, uh, there could be uh, more and more requirements to verify your identity. So you might uh, sometimes you might have to go through uh, KYC processes where you have to upload your passports, uh, national identity cards, so and so. So a particular verification happens and your identity is uh, assured more. And then only you will get uh, access to certain services there. Uh, so that's another sort of uh, onboarding that happens out there. And when it comes to B2B applications specifically, uh, what we see is there are two approaches, mainly like when it comes to B2B, uh, they can be sales-led approaches where an account manager basically first interact with the business and um, go through certain processes and at a point they will uh, they will know okay this opportunity has won and then only uh, 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 the respective organization or the individuals of that organization will get a invite to access uh, that service so uh, that's more towards a sales led approach and uh, there are other product led approaches as well basically if you look at zoom slack you just go and register your organization and you start with it and then you basically claim your business um, like claiming your domain and then start configuring your enterprise idp likewise so those are the different uh, Onboarding mechanisms, uh, actually, uh, applications today uh, uh, basically build. Yes, and so the basic objective here is make that onboarding process as seamless as possible, yeah. but also secure. So um, the level of stuff that needs to happen varies depending on the kind of the value of the the transaction or the type of work being done. Yeah, exactly. And the more frictionless onboarding provide, the more adoption you will see, actually. Okay. All right. So we're onboarded and registered, and we've verified that we are who we say we are. Uh, next comes up authentication, the second pillar. What happens here? Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to authentication, again, like... Uh, commonly, the factors you use to register are the factors that you also use to log in. As I mentioned, if you register with social lo login, then you will be using the same uh, identity to uh, access that application back. Uh, then the case is today, I mean, the security is pretty much um, uh, important today. So it's important to enforce some second factor authentication. So that's where like uh, factors like um, authenticator apps, push notifications or, um, uh, or security keys, those sort of uh, mechanisms uh, actually come. And uh, and the other key aspect is uh, when it comes to authentication, if there are 
uh, multiple applications, single sign-on plays a key role. Uh, so that's something you have to provide uh, for your users so that they can seamlessly access across uh, different applications. And again, this differ in the uh, uh, B2B application context where they will rather like log in with their enterprise IDP and uh, the organization admin may want to enforce second factor specifically. Uh, so uh, that sort of requirements also come there. And addition to that it's very important to like uh, to ba you have to balance the security and the access basically provide the access uh, in a very seamless way as well as make sure that the users are accessing very securely so for that uh, there's another practice that is being commonly employed like adaptive MFA, okay. basically based on the context. For example, you might be authenticating at a particular time and at that point only you will get a second factor or you will be authenticating uh, uh, from, uh, for example... New IP address yeah, or geolocation, yeah, right? Or geolocation, yeah. you will, uh, it will step up your authentication. So those sort of, it's important to implement those sort of mechanisms so that... Uh, users always doesn't get that second factor prompted uh, because if 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 the system knows okay this identity is tr uh, trusted, so it can give a very frictionless experience, login experience for the user. But if it sees the risk only, it will start uh, stepping up the authentication, ensuring security. And that also, I think, builds trust with the end user, right? Because yeah. they kind of understand, okay, I'm doing something that I don't normally do here. That's why they want to make sure I'm, I'm me. Yeah, yep. of course. So that's great. Okay, so next is authorization. And you've got all kinds of stuff like RBAC and ABAC and RBAC. So tell us about all that stuff. Yeah, so I think um, over the time, actually, um, Role-based access control was what's actually uh, people first started to implement in the application, and that has been commonly adopted. And even today, you see role-based uh, access control a lot in applications, especially when it comes to uh, enterprise applications where employees uh, access and login. Then comes the attribute-based access control, so it provides more fine-grained way uh, to uh, govern the access of the user. So it could be based on uh, users' attributes, for example, based on the user's department, based on the user's um, uh, social security number, something like that. Or it could be uh, also based on the resource attributes. It could be a document is confident confidential, so uh, that only certain people can access that document. So that's a tribute of the document. Or it could be uh, particularly some environment-related attributes. So we talked about, uh, we previously talked about cases where we leverage, basically we uh, prompt second factor within a certain period of time. So that's a, a attribute of that environment context, or it could be the geolocation. So those are the stuff uh, which is called as attribute-based access control, and it gives more fine-grained authorization uh, as the user access uh, the uh, uh, respective application. Uh, then comes a uh, relational based uh, access control. So this is uh, something that came up uh, uh, within recent years uh, that was actually quite pioneered by uh, Google Sansiba and uh, also adopted with Google Docs. For example, now if you take uh, a Google document, uh, you particularly have an owner. So there's a relationship. Then that owner can uh, uh, directly uh, share that uh, document with people, uh, with a direct relationship. Or it could be shared uh, with a group of people. So there's a relationship between the group and the uh, members of that group. Or you may share a particular link with the organization. So there's a relationship between the organization and the members of that organization. So, um, so that's what relationship uh, based access control is. And you could even do things like read only access versus yeah. edit as well, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I think like when it comes to authorization, there's uh, something goes just beyond the authorization we talk, typically talk about, which is role based access control, ABAC and REBAC. That is specifically uh, uh, consent as well. So consent, in my opinion, is also a way of authorizing 
uh, and at that uh, in that case basically the user authorizes uh, a certain application to do uh, to uh, do some stuff on his information for example uh, when it comes to so this particularly applies uh, when it comes to interaction with third party applications for example let's say uh, let's take trello so trello is a project management tool mm -hmm. so it may integrate with github so uh, so that users can use uh, authorized github and uh, use github commits uh, for uh, to manage their projects so in that case when a user is accessing Trello, uh, he will specifically log into, uh, and uh, Trello will give a particular window that the user needs to log into GitHub and particularly uh, authorize uh, uh, a set of repositories or the organizations to Trello to access. So in that case, user is uh, giving consent and specifically de uh, deciding, okay, I'm sharing these resources with this application. In that case, uh, considering GitHub, Trello becomes a third-party application and GitHub basically shares user information based on the user's consent uh, with um, uh, Trello. So that's also a sort of authorization because you have to take access decisions at the point uh, based on the consents that the uh, user has provided. So um, I think that's a new angle that I brought into this article uh, because when it comes to authorization we always talk about uh, these sort of um, art back a back sort of mechanisms that's commonly implemented awesome all right so our fourth pillar is self-service and um, you mentioned in your paper that it's critical to get this right uh, to keep operational costs down so I'm, I'm thinking the more you can have people do themselves, um, the, the, the more that lowers operational costs. Give us some examples of how that works. Yeah, so when it comes to self-service, I think the most common thing is uh, recovering passwords yep. and uh, setting up passwords. So in early days, basically, if you want, if you if you forget your password, you have to call a help desk, I right? Know. So It was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible, <laughs> and you have to, like, um, you can get, you, you always need to call at the business hours yeah, yeah. and that's the only time that they will serve. So it's hideous. So uh, so basically self-service. So uh, with self-service, you can actually reduce those operational costs. And uh, so if you are providing services like uh, for the user to recover their uh, um, passwords or the credentials or like to let them set up their own second factor options let them change their profile let them change their notification preferences so you can uh, leverage all those information uh, to give more seamless and secure access uh, for your users and the friction the user has to go over uh, various um, uh, uh, touch points connecting your business back connecting operations team etc uh, will be reduced and uh, they will be able to uh, get uh, access to things more faster uh, so uh, that's the main uh, thing i see that self-service provides it's a huge win it's a win for the user it's a win for the company well, yeah. we need to do as much of that as possible yeah, of course. Okay, that brings us to the final pillar, uh, which is integrating all of this stuff with uh, systems of record or the business insight tools. Um, talk about, like, what are some of these central repositories that um, would be good to integrate the identity information into? Yeah, so uh, I think um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, providing a digital business, actually, identity is at the core. Uh, of your uh, business right so then along with the identity you are building the user's profile user's information and those users information actually may be collected at different points with different engagements uh, in different different systems it could be like uh, in your crm uh, when you are interacting with your customer at the uh, uh, first point you might be gathering information there and you are storing information there and when it comes to uh, your uh, marketing platform, possibly based on the user's interaction with your website, you might have information there. And uh, you might also have different other services that you provide where uh, you might have uh, 
let's say if you have like two 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 or three applications um and uh uh you might have uh, information of that user uh, with regard to that context in that application for example let's say um, if you are running um, a, a restaurant right and then you expand it to a hotel business so uh, user might be using your restaurant system and might be using your hotel system as well so those serves different purposes right so you might have information uh, of that user in both those systems uh, in that context right so sure. but if you know like uh, uh, in your restaurant user is ordering these sort of foods you would be able to serve better in your hotel system right so that's how so that includes uh, integrating these crm systems it could be um, siloed data in your applications and it could be various customer data platforms that you are using in house and uh, it could be mdm systems as well so all these uh, as 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 um, long as you tie all these different attributes of the user with the single identity you have of the user uh, to identify okay this person relates to that this ex, this person uh, you will be able to serve uh, better for the user and also uh, in addition to that um, uh, by connecting all these systems you will be able to gather insights how these users act and uh, what sort of behaviors the users may have so that doesn't necessarily say that you will be uh, capturing all the pii data and all but uh, you can uh, uh, capture information in an anonymized way but you can still get the insights based on number based on various users who interact with your uh, system and get some general idea so that helps you to serve better for your uses that's probably like the amazon example is a good yeah, example where other people that bought this liked this other thing as well and yeah. that can be very useful because oh i forgot batteries or i forgot the wall mount the, for the item or whatever else so, yeah, yeah of course so i think that's the benefit of integrating your ciam uh, uh, with your other business systems can bring in awesome so, you know, finally, you've gone through all the five pillars, which is awesome. Very good insights here. Um, tell us how if if a company gets all of these things right, they can get that nirvana of better security and better customer experience. Yeah. So, um, so I think we discussed uh five key main points right yep. so basically as we uh, as as uh, explained previously like providing a very friction re registration experience providing a very frictionless login experience uh, helps uh, to uh, uh, grow your customer base because that's the very first entry point that the users interact with so if your registration is a friction if something fails there basically people will just you get abandonment drop. rates yeah. right because oh i don't want to create a new password that i have to remember just for yeah this of course one company. and 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 also if they feel it's not secure they will again drop right so right. it's very important for you to make sure uh it, it, it it's important for you to give them uh, a impression such that they trust your system or you trust your application so uh so basically that's what you can implement with on uh, implementing proper registration and proper login mechanisms balancing both the security aspect and the uh, experience aspect right mm -hmm. so when it comes to then uh, basically self service of course it again gives a lot of benefits for the end user so that they can uh, interact with your system very freely and customize it the way they want yeah yeah, yeah. And uh, then I think uh, the other main aspect is when it comes to uh, GDPR sort of regulations, privacy regulations. So they specifically enforce uh, uh, to let the user to opt out from your services, to opt out from a specific stuff. So self-service is quite important there and the user should be able to download their data. Uh, so self-service is quite important there. Sure. And uh, 
and when it comes to some regulations like PSD2, uh, those specifically enforces uh, second factor authentication and having some out of the band authentication, for example, like Authenticate app or have a push notification, something like that, uh, which is more rigid. So, uh, so to be in to uh, to in order to comply with these uh, regulations, you of course need to uh, have a a proper CM solution and a proper CM strategy uh, implemented. And the other aspect that we talked about is the operational efficiency, right? So basically, as we discussed, the more and more in insights that you can gain uh, connecting all the user's business properties with the identity, you will be able to serve the uh, user the better. And um, like providing all self-service facilities, there's a lot of cost that you can cut down on running uh, different operational teams to cater for the user's demands. So I think uh, this is how like uh, these key five points uh, could help uh, help a digital business to like um, implement a very frictionless personalized experience and also ensure uh, security and be comply with all the regulations that they want to adhere to as well as um, uh, reduce the operational uh, cost and uh, uh, do efficient operations. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for your insights and the examples. Um, it's a very um, ambitious approach. Um, you can see the benefits to both the customer and the various types of customers and uh, the organizations that are implementing this. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. It's nice to have this chat with you.